next session, I'm very excited to introduce you to someone. Some of you will recognize him. In fact, the reason you, the fact that you recognize him is the reason we had to kind of switch this up this year. Um, this is Rich Bordner, and he is uh, a dear friend of this ministry. He's done a lot of things for us. You may recognize him from the Think Again conference. Did anybody come to Think Again? Oh yeah, there was a lot of y'all there. I remember seeing a lot of your faces. Um, but we've asked him to come today and speak to you guys on a topic that I think is going to be really helpful to you in your schools. Uh, religious pluralism. You guys probably have picked up on throughout our four days of conversations that there are so many different religious convictions and views across the world. Some of them are actually considered religions formally. Others of them are very much religions, but we don't even, they don't call them that yet. I remember hearing John Bray yesterday in the critical race theory session talk about how critical race theory is functionally acting as a religion. So far as it even has martyrs, it has doctrine, it has all of the all of the qualifications to call itself a religion. That's the nature of the world we're living in. So we're constantly finding more idols to worship. And so Rich is going to speak to you guys today and give you some context. Because you guys are about to walk into a battlefield where there's going to be so many different religions. And so hopefully what we're able to glean from him today will help you as you navigate that field. So will you guys join me in welcoming Rich. Good morning. Am I on? Am I on? No, what? Okie doke. You guys hear me? Yes. Okay. Who was here last year? Okay, so last year I was, I was an atheist. I was working, you guys know that. Uh, so don't worry, I'm not going to mess with you today. I, I forgot my atheist glasses, so uh, you get the real me. You guys excited to go back to school in a week or two? Actually face to face? No, yes, no, okay, so we're a little mixed. All right, well, I, I'm excited. Um, it's been a year and a half since I've actually taught face to face, and uh, I hope I never have to teach on Zoom again. That's like trying to sing underwater is teaching on Zoom, you know. So when I went to graduation last year, there were some students that I, I had for a whole year, but I, I had never seen their face. And I'd seen their ceiling fan, you know, it's like either they have their camera off or it's like, you know, tilted at their ceiling or it's plenty. Any of you guys guilty of doing that? Yeah. Shame on you. So I, you know, I'd walk up and they'd be like, hey, Mr. Borden, and I'd be like, and you are, so, oh, I'm Susie, I was your student. Oh, it's good to know. So I know your ceiling better than I know your face. So I'm glad I don't have to deal with that anymore, at least for the time being. I don't think that might change, but um, I've got a lot to cover, so I'm going to jump right in. If you guys want my sources, I'm not going to bore you with my sources during the talk, but if you want them, you can just email me and I'll be happy to send me list of references to you. Uh, I'm going to start by uh, telling a story. Go ahead and advance the slide. Uh, I teach philosophy at Plano Senior High School. That's one of the subjects that I teach. And um, earlier this year, we had just watched a debate on God's existence between the Christian William Craig, who's facing him, and the atheist who's got his back to Christopher Hitchens. And uh, actually, during this portion of the debate, the, the uh, cross-examination Hitchens asked Craig, do you think there are any religions that are wrong? And Craig immediately said, certainly, you know, no problem getting to that. And Hitchens asked, well, can you name one? And again, without even hesitating, Craig said, Islam. And then Hitchens goes, well, that's, that's an awful lot of people that you think are wrong, right? And Craig says, yeah, okay, so what? And so they have their exchange, and they go on the debate, they finish the debate, and then the next day in class, I'm talking with my students about the debate, asking them what they thought about it, what's going back and forth. And uh, one of my students brings up this moment, and she really has a problem with what Craig said. She's like, how could he uh, criticize something that's so personal to people? How could he condemn so many people? It seems intolerant and narrow-minded. And a lot of the students in the class agreed with her, and they kind of shared the same sentiment. So this is a common sentiment. But it doesn't come from nowhere. It comes from somewhere. Um, it, it, one of the sources of this comes from is an actual worldview, a viewpoint called religious pluralism. And it's the view that basically all religions lead to God. They're all, they're all good. So that's what we're going to tackle uh, in, in this session. We're going to kind of take it apart. All right. So this is, go ahead and advance the slide. Uh, this is a, 
a, a tempting view in this day and age because we interact with such diverse people, right? You know, your, your banker is Muslim. The two students that sit next to you in English class, they're both Buddhist. Your best friend might be Hindu. And they all seem very sincere and very nice. And so it can kind of seem a little rude and maybe off-putting to criticize, like I said, something that's so personal and so dear to them. You know, it can seem intolerant. And this is even popular in the church. So the Barna Research Group is a um, organization that is constantly doing surveys and kind of taking the temperature of the culture, especially uh, about what people's beliefs are in the church. And in 2019, they came out with a study, 47% of millennial Christians, that's, that's not you guys, that's the you know, mid-20s to early 30s generation, uh, who attend the church regularly and say that religion is an important part of their lives, so this is not check-the-box Christians. These are Christians that are at least somewhat devout. They agreed with the following statement. 47% of them said that it is wrong to share one's personal beliefs with someone of a different faith in hopes that they will one day share the same faith. So 47% is a lot of people in the church. Now, the, the picture is a little complicated, okay, because the, the very same survey found that 96% of that same group, which is a huge number, you almost never get that high in a survey, uh, but 96% agreed with the following statement. It is, um, where am I? My notes. There you go. Part of my faith means being a witness about Jesus. And then 94% agreed that the best thing that could ever happen to someone was for them to come to know Jesus. So it's kind of a mixed bag, right? They're, they're coming and going, talking out of both sides of their mouth. Maybe we could say that they're confused, but no matter what, there's still a high degree of this pluralism in the church. And so... You know, uh, go, go ahead and advance the slide. We need to think deeper about this. All right? Uh, we shouldn't jump on the bandwagon just because it seems nice and it feels right. Those are horrible tests for what to believe and horrible tests for truth. So compassion includes truth. you got to hold both at the same time. And you can't sacrifice one to the other. You know, being a good neighbor means that we shouldn't reject truth uh, in the name of compassion. You know, if it turns out that pluralism misses part of reality, then hawking it is no more compassionate than, you know, giving ice cream to a diabetic because ice cream goes down better than the medicine does. So just because it feels nice doesn't doesn't mean much. So we're gonna we're gonna take uh, take a look at this deeper in this talk. Uh, one caveat before I really jump in: the kind of pluralism that I have in mind in this talk that I'm gonna critique is not this kind of a, like a descriptive or a procedural pluralism where you know there are in fact other views out there and we should live in peace and harmony with those we disagree with and we should love them and treat them kindly and you know allow them to hold their views and advocate for them that sort of thing that sort of procedural pluralism is not what i'm talking about what i am talking about go ahead is a more you know metaphysical view that all religions lead to God and that all or at least most of them are equally true and kind of on the same playing field. Uh, Oprah, who is the uh, I guess you could call her the Pope of religious pluralism, she puts it like this. Go ahead and advance it. She says one of the mistakes that human beings make is believing that there is only one way to live, that we don't accept that there are diverse ways of being in the world. That there are millions of ways to be a human being, in many ways, many paths to what you call God. Her path might be something else. And when she gets there, she might call it delight, but her loving and her kindness and her generosity uh, it brings her to the same point that it brings you. It doesn't matter whether she called it God along the way or not. There couldn't possibly be just one way. There couldn't possibly be. So even Mother Teresa, go ahead gets in on the pluralism game. She says there's only one God, and he's God to all. Therefore, it's important that everyone is seen as equal before God. Okay, so, so far so good, right? Well, here's, here's where she goes on the rest. I've always said that we should help a Hindu become a better Hindu, a Muslim become a better Muslim, and a Catholic become a better Catholic. Next slide. Uh, maybe you've heard the elephant illustration. Uh, hit return again one more time. One more time. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So uh, there's this elephant in the middle of the courtyard, and there's a bunch of blind men, they're touching the elephant, they're causing a ruckus because they're all disagreeing with each other. You know, the blind man's got a hold of the tusk, and so the elephant's the spear, and the blind man's got a hold of the elephant's legs, says, no, you're wrong, the elephant's a pillar, and then the third guy who's 
feeling the elephant size. Says, no, you're both wrong. The elephant's a brick wall. So this, this wakes up the Rajah, the king, comes out of his window and he says, but you guys shut up. You're all wrong. You all got a part of the elephant. You got to put them together. You got to put your descriptions together to make a description of the whole elephant. Now, shut up and let me sleep. And so this illustration is meant to communicate that each religion is a part of larger truth. Or in some instances, um, even a kind of a skeptical conclusion that culture has so blinded us that we're incapable of knowing the truth. And then the, uh, you got the, the mountain illustration. Go ahead, next slide. That all religions, you know, they might start at different places, but they all end at the same place. That from God's perspective, any sincere effort will work for him. The details don't matter. So those are a couple of the illustrations that you might come over here. And then, go ahead. You've got arguments from what I call tolerance and nice people. So the argument from tolerance is basically that tolerance is a virtue, we need to seek it. Uh, and it's opposite, intolerance is a vice, we need to avoid it. And tolerance just means, you know, it's, it's, it's intolerant to criticize somebody's deeply held personal beliefs. You want to be affirming, you want to celebrate, um, you know, love is love, that sort of thing. And then the argument from what I call the nice people is that these people who believe differently than you, they're, they're nice people, they're sincere. They, in a lot of ways, they can beat the pants off a lot of Christians in the virtue department. So why are you condemning them to hell just because they have a different belief from you? It seems really weird. The nice people are. Okay? So that's how you usually hear it in culture. Go ahead. So uh, in a moment, we're going to take this apart. All right? But what I want to do first is I want to give you guys a chance to interact. When, whenever I teach... I don't just want to talk at you for an hour. I want to give you a chance to actually talk with each other because that kind of breaks things up. So we're going to do that right now. So um, I'll just give you like a minute or two to do this. Uh, turn to a partner. Okay, go ahead and make eye contact with somebody. Not awkwardly, but go ahead and get a partner. Uh, if you need to get a group of three, that is fine. Uh, but here's the prompt. Just kind of process what you've heard so far. Uh, if you need uh, something specific, uh, do you do you see this in our culture? Maybe you've seen it in a TV show. Maybe you've gotten a conversation with somebody where you've confronted this sort of viewpoint so tell that story to your partner and then uh, what, do, what do you think of the illustrations uh, see if you can come up with some responses before I actually jump in so take a minute or two talk amongst yourselves and then we'll come back and we'll keep going all right go ahead seconds. All right. Let's come back. We're going to move on in a second, but I got time for one person you want to share from the whole group you met. So, great person. All right, go ahead. Okay, so the first critique is 
Ask yourself this question. What does the elephant stand for? What does the elephant represent in the illustration? Yeah, the answer is God or reality, something like that, right? You realize that the elephant is silent in, in the illustration? So the, that means the illustration is making an assumption, an assumption that is not defended, but it needs to be questioned. The assumption is that God hasn't spoken, that God is silent or reality is, is silent. And if God speaks, then all bets are off, right? Because then you can know what reality is like because he's telling you what he's like. But the person giving the illustration just assumes out of nowhere that that hasn't happened. So you need to bring that up and you need to press the person to defend that, not just assume it. And usually the defense is just some kind of circular argument. It's like, well, uh, God hasn't spoken. I've never heard him. So like, okay, well, that's, that doesn't mean much. You're just one person. Or some other, you know, similarly question begging defense and, you know, press them on that. So that's the first problem. The second problem is that it obscures the fact that differing religions can't be harmonized together. Okay, they are, like you said in the back, they are contradictory in nature. So it's not like religions are superficially different, fundamentally the same, it's the other way around. They differ on anything of any substance. They differ on what our problem is, they disagree on what the solution is. They disagree on what the nature of God is. Is it one God versus many gods? Is it the God of Mormonism that used to be a man and flawed and now he's progressed through obedience to God and he's going to continue to progress? Is it the God of Christianity who is a triune God and Jesus is a person in that Godhead? You know, what is it? And this is, this is a fundamental thing. This is the nature of God. They disagree on the nature of the afterlife. They disagree on how to get there. All these things. Right? And it pretty much the same goes with the mountain illustration. According to each religion, somebody or something is like, it's not the same. You know, who's going to meet you at the top of the mountain? According to Hinduism, many gods are at the top of the mountain. According to Islam, it's just one god at the top of the mountain. And if you're a Christian and you say that Jesus is that god, that alone in Islam is sheer. That is the unforgivable sin that's enough to condemn you to hell. So these are some pretty big differences, right? You can't can't make them all fit together. Uh, saying that all religions are basically describing part of the same ultimate reality, it's like Greg Kogel puts it really well. He says that's kind of like saying that aspirin and arsenic are basically the same because they're both white medicine tablets. It's like, yeah, you guys know arsenic, right? Eat that and die. So, uh, yeah, they're both white medicine tablets, true as far as it goes, but it's the, it's the differences that are the crucial determiner between life and death. And he goes on to just point out one example, the afterlife. You know, when, when you die, do you rot in the ground? Or do you go to judgment and that's heaven and hell? Or do you get reincarnated as a different life form? Or, you know, do you hitch a ride on the back of Haley's Comet? You know, maybe you do none of those, but you can't do them all. Right? It's not the case. They can all be true. Truth by nature is exclusive. So the illustration obscures that. The third problem... Go ahead and uh, advance it a little more. There you go. Uh, the third problem is that there's a sleight of hand in the illustration that obscures a contradiction within pluralism itself. And so whenever somebody uh, gives you this illustration, you need to ask them a question. You need to ask them, okay, uh, which person are you in the illustration? There's only two options, right? You're either the king, the raja, or you're one of the blind men. I mean, technically, there's, there's a third, there's, there's the elephant, but nobody wants to admit they're God, so just, just never mind that, right? So there's, there's two options. Okay, so which, which uh, person in, in the illustration stands for your viewpoint, the pluralist viewpoint? So let's say the person's, you know, they're kind of feeling humble that day. So they say, uh, all right, so I'm one of the blind men. Well, if the person is one of the blind men, then why think that this pluralism is any more true than, say, I don't know, fundamentalist Christianity? According to the parable, both are equally blind, right? Which means that pluralism, according to his own admission now, is no better or no more true or no more morally praiseworthy than the fundamentalist Christian that insists that he's alone is right and everybody else is going to hell. But that's probably not a bullet that the pluralist wants to bite. He probably doesn't want to admit that he's on the same level as the guy that he's looking down on. So, his only other option then would be to admit that, okay, I'm, I'm the Raja, I'm the king. And in that case, the follow-up question is, so how did you escape the blindness that infect everybody else? 
How is it that you can see correctly and everybody else can't? That your view, pluralism, is an accurate description of the divine light while everybody else is groping about in darkness. See what, he, what he's doing is he is applying a critique that he applies to everybody else but he exempts himself from. Arbitrarily. There's no reason for it. There's no reason to assume that he's the one that's, that, that can see correctly and everybody else is blind. Okay, so I really, I really want to drive this home. Right? Pluralism claims to be right, but it chastises others for doing the exact same thing. So that's, that's cheating. Right? Can't do that. Uh, so the, the pluralist thinks, you know, think about this. The pluralist thinks that his view, pluralism, is superior to all the other exclusivist views out there. I mean, that's just what it means to believe something. You, you think that your view is true, that it's better than the opposite, right? Um, so they think that those, like Christians who hold exclusivist views, are wrong. So it's like he's skewering himself with his own spear. It's like a person that says, you know, there's no rules, but here's a rule. Or the soccer player. Any of you guys play soccer? Soccer players here. Nobody? Wow. Okay, so maybe this analogy will fall flat. I don't know. But it's like the soccer player that's constantly cleaning other players aggressively. But then as soon as somebody like brushes his jersey, he's like looking at the ref and be like, whoa, no, you know. What was that? Yes, yes, he's he's playing to the referee. It's like it's like that. So you can't you can't have it both ways. Okay. Uh, Michael Kruger, uh, he's he talks a lot about progressive kind of liberal Christianity. So this quote I'm about to read, he's talking about that, but this applies to pluralism just as much. He's talking about how uh, progressive Christians a lot of times they chastise people who think they're certain, but they have a certainty of their own. Okay, so this also applies to uh, our, our purposes here. He says, uh, progressive Christianity laments the dogmatism and certainty of biblical Christianity. All would be much better, this person says, if everyone would just admit their uncertainty. Yet he is quite certain of his views and quick to condemn the other positions. Here he simply smuggles in his certainty through the back door. Progressives and pluralists are quick to condemn all sorts of behaviors they see in the world around them, while insisting that Bible-believing Christians are wrong when they do so. For example, consider the debate over same-sex marriage. Notice that we hear very few progressives say things like, well, we just don't know the answer here, we can't be certain what to think about it. No, instead we get certainty, we get dogmatism. Thus the real issue is not certainty at all. It is what one is certain about. Progressives have simply swapped one set of certain beliefs for another. We all have things that we are certain about, things that we believe to be true and real. The key question involves the basis for our certainty. So again, can't say it enough, truth by nature is exclusive. Uh, both analogies, the mountain and the elephant, fail to deal with different religions honestly on their own terms. And they kind of twist them uh, to twist the fundamentals of each religion to kind of make them fit underneath this pluralist umbrella, but it doesn't quite work. Okay. It can't be harmonized together. Uh, pretty much everything else that um, pluralism misses is kind of a riff off the errors in these, these illustrations. So go ahead and advance the slide. So let's say somebody says this. For God, the details don't matter. What counts as sincerity? So you need to ask another question. How do you know this? All right. How do you know that the details for God doesn't matter? Um, if we're all blind, like the parable, like the elephant parable suggests, well then how does a person have that accurate insight in the mind of God? See, it's kind of coming and going again. Most often, people just kind of get this from their heads. They just make this up. Or they, you know, maybe they get it from social media memes or something. It's kind of like pat themselves on the back in a, in a you know, virtue signaling. But, you know, you need to realize that it seems nice. But again, faith must be not only sincere, but it needs to be directed at the right object. Okay, so let's... My anniversary is tomorrow, 12 years. So uh, my wife's name is Azichi. She's not here today. But uh, let's say that uh, tomorrow I walk in the door with flowers and I hug and I kiss my wife and I say, Hello, Jenny. <laughs> yeah. What kind of, yeah, uh oh. Who's Jenny? Probably wouldn't say, sound like that. It'd probably sound like, Who's Jenny? <laughs> and I go, Well, you know, I'm sincere. I'm well meaning. Right? No, not the right answer. But let's say that I try to uh, cure coronavirus while uh, by ingesting fish tank cleaner, like that couple in Arizona did, right? 
I, I might sincerely believe that it will cure me, but I'll be sincerely dead in a few moments. And then, actually, I think I think the husband of that pair died. I, mean, I, I think, if I remember correctly. So yeah, it doesn't matter how much faith you have, whether you're sincere. What matters is whether it's directed at the right object. Okay. Uh, next. And there's another sleight of hand here. They have redefined the tolerance. Okay, so tolerance classically meant uh, it required disagreement. Right? It meant that you disagree with a person, but you're going to allow them to uh, have their view and, and compete in the marketplace of ideas. Okay, uh, to kind of use a sports analogy, classically tolerance is like everybody's on the bracket. Everybody's got a chance to win, but not everybody gets a trophy. Right? There's winners and there's losers. So that's classical tolerance. But modern tolerance is something different. It holds that all views are equally right. And all viewpoints are celebrated, and thus everything is flattened. And so on the modern view of tolerance, the classical view is actually intolerant. And so what has happened here, the modern view has it backwards. The classical view is the right definition. Uh, what's happened is that the modern view has engaged in a little sleight of hand and it has, it, it trades on the good vibes and the good sounding word, tolerance. And it vacates the definition and smuggles in an alternative definition uh, that is much more extreme. But it doesn't do it by actually arguing, it just does it by kind of def default, or just kind of by fiat. Alright? So again, it's like, it's like that soccer player that's cleating everybody, but then as soon as he gets clipped, he's complaining with the ref. It's the same sort of thing. Okay? Now the last reason why uh, pluralism is off the rails, go ahead, is it renders the cross meaningless. So if pluralism is the way to go, realize that Jesus died for nothing. Okay, here's what I mean by that. Um, according to the Christian faith, give me, give me like a, a quick one-liner, why did Jesus die on the cross? Because of Okay, right, to reconcile us to God. Right, Jesus died to reconcile us to God. He solved our problem. But if other religions are equally valid ways to solve our problem, whatever that problem is, then why did Jesus have to die? Did, did he die to show us love? Well, that'd be a really weird way to show us love. Right? And other, other ways, other religions are equally valid paths to love, equally valid ways to show us love. Well, maybe he died to be our example. Okay, again, weird example dying on a cross like that, but other religious paths are equally valid ways to show us how to live. You know, recognize the cross was an extremely painful way to go. It was torture. And he didn't, it wasn't like he was just, just innocent. He went there willingly and on purpose. So why would he do that if other religions are ways, good ways to solve our problem? It would be like somebody stuck in a burning building. And you insist on the most dangerous and risky way to rescue the person. It's like, well, you gotta dig this 100 foot tunnel underneath the burning building and come up through the floor and then rescue the guy that way. When all he's gotta do is get up, walk 10 feet, and walk out the door. If that's all he has to do to save himself, why would you dig this tunnel and go through all that business? Ain't nobody got time for that. So, I mean, if, if pluralism is the way to go, the cross is a, a really weird thing, okay? Um, but the cross is not weird. Here's why. Jesus is the only one that solved our problem. He's both diagnosed our problem correctly and provided the only adequate solution. So our problem isn't that we've just made a few mistakes. Our problem is that we're rebels. We are thoroughly guilty before a just God. We've broken God's law many times over, and we are criminals in his court. We've racked up an incredible debt that we can't repay on our own. And Jesus is the only one that has the funds to pay for our debt. No other religious solution adequately takes care of our problem. It takes care of our debt and our guilt before God. I mean, just to see this, compare your, just one year of your life, in thought, word, and deed, to just five of the Ten Commandments. You'll have an incredibly long rap sheet. I do. Anybody does. Right? That's the nature of the beast. Uh, no just judge, when looking at our rap sheet, is going to go, ah, you know, you're well-meaning, you're just going to have some wrong beliefs, so come on in. You know, no just judge is going to let that rap sheet off. Um, really, right, wrong beliefs 
That, that's not the problem. It's not like, you know, we just kind of missed a couple questions on an obscure theology test and we're otherwise innocent. It's like, no, we're, we're criminals. Okay? And the cross solves that problem. Not any old God will do. That's why the cross matters. Okay? All right, so we're going to pause again. Go ahead and advance. Yeah. So this time, turn to, turn to the same partner. You, know, you didn't like the last partner. Turn to somebody different. And uh, just process what you just heard. So kind of maybe summarize it, work through it a little bit, take a minute or two, and then I'll, I'll take a question or two. All right? Go ahead. So, um, this is what we're going to do in the next section of the talk. So, some people say this. They'll say, look, uh, it's your, your illustrations, they're bad analogies because in those illustrations like aspirin and arsenic and fish tank cleaner and that sort of thing, you're talking about physical reality. And they say, you know, truth is exclusive and it's objective when you're talking about physical reality, but you're talking about religion, which is subjective by nature. It's all based on faith. It's all based on personal experience. There's a massive disconnect here. And this sort of response uh, reflects a worldview, specifically a worldview about what counts as knowledge. And this worldview is called scientism. Now, I've got to be careful. So when I say scientism, I, I don't just mean doing science, like using the scientific method to discover truth about the natural world. Nor do I mean a love of science or a healthy respect of science or anything like that. Specifically, scientism is a view that restricts science, or excuse me, restricts knowledge to science and its methods. So it says, if science doesn't show it, then you can't know it. Okay? So only science provides knowledge of reality. That's the view. And there's also a softer version of scientism that kind of technically recognizes that maybe other domains can, can give some form of knowledge, but science is superior by far. That it is the best path to genuine knowledge, head and shoulders above everything else. So whether you're talking about the stronger version, that only science provides knowledge of reality, or the weaker version, that kind of technically grants outside knowledge, but still science is authoritative, uh, both are really popular. And both have a marginalizing effect on religion. It subjectivizes it. So here's what I mean by that. Um, if science is, is the king, then somebody who holds that view of knowledge will, is going to say, well, we can know things about the physical world, but we just believe things about religion and morality. Evolution we can know, but we can just have beliefs about God. Emphasis on the word just. It's not knowledge. It's not truth. It's just opinion about God. Okay, so when it comes to knowledge, somebody like this is going to ascribe Christianity to kind of the JV bench. All right, that science, uh, science says jump, and religion, Christianity has the answer how high. So it flattens religion to ice cream flavors. You know, when you 
When you go to the ice cream parlor, you choose one flavor, your buddy chooses another flavor, you don't like look down on, the, on your buddy, right? Not if you're, I, mean, I guess if you're weird to do, but, but normally you don't, because it's like all the same, right? So scientism turns religion into that, okay? So we're going to examine this, because this is where pluralism ultimately comes from. All right, go ahead. Just gonna, we're going to skip this. Next one. All right. So first, I want you to know that this, this doesn't come from science. I mean, scientists say this all the time, but it's not like an experiment will tell you that scientism is true. Okay? Um, it's a philosophical claim. Scientism is a philosophical thesis about science. It's not science proper. That's the first thing. So the second thing is that it's self-refuting it. It saws off the branch that it's sitting on. It shoots itself in the foot. So I made the same critique about pluralism earlier, so uh, I need to kind of explain this on a little bit deeper level. Go ahead and advance the slide. Okay, so let's take a, take a look at this example. This is an example of a self-refuting statement. You know, think of the picture in your head, sawing off the branch you're sitting on. All right? So there's no, there are no English sentences longer than three words. So how is this, and the next one, go ahead. That's another example. Okay, somebody, you ever seen somebody with this t-shirt on? I've actually never seen this, but I, I see this as an illustration of using these talks all the time, so I don't know. But a self-refuting statement, go ahead, is self-refuting if it does three things. So number one, it refers to a group of things, and it establishes a criteria of acceptance for membership in that group. Number two, the statement itself is included in that group of things. And then number three, it fails its own test for acceptability. So actually, go back two slides if you can. Thank you. So let's run this through the three tests. Does it, does it refer to a group of things? Yes, English sentences. Does it establish a criteria of acceptance? Yes, can't be longer than three words. Does it include itself in that group? Yes, it reports to be an English sentence. And then, does it fail its own test for acceptability? Yes, it is longer than three words. So, shoots itself in the foot. Okay, self refuting Now, advance a couple slides. One more. Uh, another one. There you go. So what about this data? This is scientism. The only things we can know are things that are tested by science. How is that self refuting Well, does it refer to a group of things? Yes, things we can know. Does it establish a test of, of uh, acceptability? Yes, testable by science, right. Does it include itself in that group? Yes, it purports to convey the truth. It's a knowledge claim, okay? And does it fail its own test? Well, how can you test that? What experiment would verify this? The answer is none. So this is a philosophy, it's not science proper. Okay, so it's therefore self refuting Now, even if you're talking about the softer version, go ahead, next slide. Um, even if you're talking about the softer version, that softer version of scientism, or the stronger version, doesn't matter. They are foes, not friends of science, and they both lead to really weird conclusions that are not true. So, um, here's what I mean by that. Contra-scientism, there are things that we can know with greater certainty in theology and morality than in science. Okay, stay with me for a second. Hear me out. Go ahead, advance the slide. Um, this is J.P. Moreland, he's one of my professors in my master's degree program, and he puts it like this. He says, consider two claims. Number one, electrons exist. Number two, it is wrong to torture babies for the fun of it. Which do we know with greater certainty? Two is the correct answer. Why? The history of the electron has gone through various changes in what an electron is supposed to be. No one today believes that Thomsonian electrons J.J. Thompson was the uh, discoverer of electrons, by the way. No one believes that Thompsonian electrons exist because our views have changed so much. It's not unreasonable to believe that in 50 to 100 years, um, I lost my place here. There you go. In 50 to 100 years, scientific depictions of the electron will change so much that scientists will no longer believe that what we mean by an electron today exists. Regarding two, someone may not know how they know it's true, but nevertheless, we all, in fact, know it is true. If someone denies that, he needs therapy, not an argument. <laughs> now, it is not hard to believe that in 50 to 100 years, most people will no longer believe too. But it is hard to see what kind of rational considerations could be discovered that would render to an irrational belief. 
Thus, we have more certainty in two than we do in one. Okay, good for thought. Now, what do I mean when I say that scientism in both forms is a foe, not a friend of science? Here's what I mean. Um, science can't happen without presupposing certain things, like um, the laws of logic, the laws of math, correspondence view of truth, without presupposing that the world is intelligible, that it's objective, and that we can rationally understand it by investigating it. These are all things that don't come from science. Science has to assume them even to get off the ground. But the thing is, is that scholars in the academy have questioned all of those assumptions and more. They've given counter-arguments to them. And so science can't justify them. Science has to assume them before even science is possible. So it's the job of philosophy to defend those assumptions. And so if you're relegating philosophy to the JV bench, basically, you're undermining the very foundation that science depends on even to exist and to do what it does. Okay? So scientism undercuts science itself. So that's scientism. So you, you take apart the foundation that generates religious pluralism so you can you know, fully understand where pluralism comes from. You've got to understand really its roots before you can fully take it apart. Okay? Now, I'm coming to the end. Almost there. Few more minutes. Go ahead and advance the slide. I want to spend a few minutes talking about why this is important. Why should you guys care about dismantling pluralism and figuring it out why it's false? Well, there's a couple of reasons. Number one, Jesus was not a pluralist. Not even close. Read any page of his biographies, the Gospels, and you will find him going the other way. All right. Just I'll just give you one verse. John three eighteen. I could go on for 20, 30 minutes giving you verses, but here's just one. So he's talking to Nicodemus. He's talking about being born again. He says, whoever believes in him, that is the Son of God himself, Jesus, is not condemned. But whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. And, you know, if you read the whole chapter, the context doesn't change that. All right, that's just one verse. Um, so Jesus wasn't a pluralist, and we are Christ, Christians, and faithfulness of Jesus is kind of what we're all about, then that requires us to reject pluralism and go with Jesus. Okay? Now, a lot of people criticize us for being exclusive. Like I said earlier, they say we're intolerant. Um, but realize this, doesn't, this didn't come from us. We didn't make this up. It's not like the church is kind of like, well, you know, I want to lose friends and alienate people, so I'm going I'm to do this. Uh, no, this comes straight from Jesus himself, and we're just trying to be faithful to what he taught. Uh, so David Horner, who's another philosopher, by the way, puts it this way. He says, is this an intolerant claim? Yes, unless it is true. And if it is true, it's not intolerant because there's nothing intolerant about simply telling the truth. So you can't have it both ways. You can either have Jesus or pluralism, not both. I mean, you can have a Jesus of your own image, a Jesus that affirms your, you know, affirms your identity or whatever. But you can't have a real Jesus, the Jesus of Scripture, and pluralism at the same time. A uh, second reason why this is important is because it obscures God's justice and it maligns the character of God. Because it minimizes our rebellion. It just makes our problem out to be life enhancement. Okay, but remember, our problem is not that. Our problem is that we're criminals. Okay? And so pluralism makes God's justice and wrath look petty and look arbitrary. And it leaves us with kind of this gentle, grandfatherly dude in the sky that, you know, pats us on the back and has a shoulder cry on, but it's... It's, it's an impotent God. It's not the God of Jesus. It's not the God of scriptures. It's not a God that's, that's you know, worth you devoting your life to. Okay. And then the third reason is that the truth will set you free. It's obviously false. Okay. And you don't want to believe false things. So when it comes to doing life well and flourishing, you want the truth. In the long run, that's going to help more than believing lies. Okay. And especially believing the truth over the lies will help you be resilient and facing the pressure of the culture. Go ahead. Uh, this guy named J.D. Vance. So he's uh, he's currently running for Senate in Ohio, but before he did that, he was a, he was a best-selling author. He wrote a book called Hillbilly Elegy. It was actually a movie on Netflix called Hillbilly Elegy. It was based on the book. And um, it was kind of like his, his uh, poverty to success story. He grew up in poverty in southwestern Ohio and eventually ended up graduating uh, from Yale with a law degree. So it's a really cool story. Yeah, but for a time, he actually walked away in college and became an atheist. He doesn't really go into this much in the book and in the movie, but in his other speeches, he, he goes into this a lot. Here's what he says. This is a long quote, so bear with me. 
No, we're almost done. My abandonment of religion was more cultural than intellectual. And the truth is that I discarded it for the simplest of reasons, the madness of crowds. Much of my new atheism came down to a desire for social acceptance among American elites. I spent so much of my time around a different type of people with a different set of priorities that I couldn't help but absorb some of the preferences. I became interested in secularism, just as my attention turned to my separation from the Marines and my impending transition to college. I knew how the educated tend to feel about religion, at best, provincial and stupid, at worst, evil. I was fitting in to my new caste in deed and emotion. I'm embarrassed to admit this. And if I could say something in my defense, it wasn't exactly conscious. I didn't think to myself, I'm not going to be a Christian because Christians are stupid and I want to plant myself firmly in the meritocratic master class. Socialization operates in more subtle but more powerful ways. My son, for example, is two, and he has in the last six months transitioned from ripping our German shepherd's fur out to hugging and kissing him gleefully. Part of that comes from the joy of giving and receiving affections from man's best friend. But part of it comes from the fact that my wife and I grimace and complain when he tortures the dog, but coo and laugh when he loves on it. He responds to us as much as I responded to the educated caste to which I slowly gained exposure. In college, very few of my friends and even fewer of my professors had any sort of religious faith. Secularism may not have been a prerequisite to join the elites, but it sure made things easier. So here's, here's the point. I'm going to land the plane here. Uh, you're going to face that pressure. You probably already are. But when you get to college, when you get to the work world, the military, wherever you're going after graduation, it's going to get worse. And you're going to need to have a solid Christian mind if you're going to, if you're going to be resilient to that pressure. And so knowing the ins and outs of pluralism is one small part of that larger project. If you, you know, you're going to need a backbone to have some courage. You're going to need to be okay with being opposed. You're going to need to be okay with being weird. You know, being weird is not dyeing your hair. Being weird is taking a controversial stance on something that everybody else thinks is stupid or bigoted. And if you're going to withstand that pressure, you're going to need to have some things figured out. And so this is, again, one small part of developing that background. Okay? So I think that is it. Go ahead and advance the slide. Next one. Okay, so a little bit about what I do. Uh, some of you guys have heard me a couple times now, uh, but I just want to tell those who haven't heard. I'm the founder of a group called the Daniel Collaborative, and basically what we do is we focus on helping adults pass the baton on the next generation, so that would be you guys. All right, so um, go ahead. I, I recently caved and joined Facebook and Twitter. Did I say it right? Is it Twitter? Twitter? Really? Wow. I've been saying it wrong this whole time. Yeah, uh, I might live to regret this, but I, I recently joined Twitter like a week ago. So you can find me there, you can find me on Facebook. And, uh, you know, I'll post little videos a couple days a week, what I call Food for Thoughts. It's like, you know, one minute, two minute videos on, you know, a small challenge or a little, little nugget for you. And I have a newsletter. If you go to my website, you can sign up for my newsletter. You can tell your parents to sign up for my newsletter. I send it out every month, and it has blog posts, and it has helpful resources. Uh, just some stuff that I, I, I hope encourages you, encourages your parents, and helps you guys become better disciples. Uh, this next week, probably midweek, I'm going to send out a newsletter that has some resources on two related issues that I didn't have time to get into. And so that's the, the question of what about those who have never heard, and the question of what is called inclusivism. Inclusivism is basically, you know, there's one way to God, it's through Jesus. But you don't need to believe in Jesus in order to gain the benefits of Christ's forgiveness. So that's kind of something that's making inroads in the church. And I'm going to provide some resources to help you think through that. And the, what about those who have never heard? And some further resources on scientism, because I didn't really go a whole lot of detail on that. So if you want those resources, sign up for that newsletter or have your parents do it. Um, that's just there for you. I, I do stuff like this. I go to other churches. And you know, the primary thing is the role play. So, you know, if you want to bring it to your church, talk to your pastor. I would love to work with uh, wherever your church is. So that's, that's me. Um, that's pretty much it. we got a, we got a few minutes here, like three or four minutes for questions. I know that was kind of a drink from a fire hydrant, but if you guys have a question, I will take it now. I can't guarantee a good answer, but I'll do my best. Okay. Last thought, 60 seconds. 
Um, the wrong way to take this is to just like have the, I've got my apologetics guns and I'm going to go into campus now and defeat the enemy. You know, that sort of thing. Uh, that's not the way we do this, right? They're not the enemy anyway. The lies are the enemy. The adversary is the enemy. They're, they're you know, fellow casualties. And so what I, I think I want to leave you with is just learn how to converse well. Learn, learn the art of gracious disagreement. Because you don't have to go along to get along. You don't have to agree with everybody, right? In my philosophy class, that's the phrase that I hear the most. Is, I agree, and I know they don't agree, but just kind of saying that to be nice. You don't have to be that guy. But at the same time, you know, learn to push back and to be skeptical and to uh, disagree uh, graciously, lovingly, in the right way. How to do that is a, is a talk for another time. It's like a you know, whole series we devote to that. But I just want to plant the seed now that... You know, learn how to ask good questions, learn how to converse, rather than just like, train the guns, fire them, okay? So, thank you guys. You've been a very attentive audience. Love coming here. Love what you guys do. Hope you guys get, have a good school year, okay?